talk about the French Revolutionary period, which goes on for almost a decade uh, in France and part of Europe, uh, 1789 to 90. Now, I'll kind of get into that today because that's a major event really uh, in European history that affects not just France, you know, politically or whatever, socially, uh, but it does affect Europe uh, as well. Now, I think they say the French Revolution was one of the most influential uh, revolutions that took place uh, in the world. I think the other one is the American Revolution, of course, which I'll kind of touch base a little bit on today. I usually don't cover as much into that, uh, but I'll talk talk about it from the French perspective of the revolution uh, and all that. So anyway, um, I'm going to, of course, first talk about you know the French Revolution. Like I said, uh, it took place over a 10-year period, so 1789 uh, to 99. Uh, is the period, of course, of the French Revolution. Uh, it wasn't just a political revolution. It was social, too. It changed a lot of the social fabric, of course, uh, of France uh, after that. It also overthrew uh, absolutism. Remember, divine right had been pretty much the main political ideology that dominated Europe uh, with the Bourbon regime. Uh, so they get rid of that. Uh, and then they even bring in, you know, democratic reforms to the country uh, as well. Uh, of course, the other thing everybody's heard about uh, with the French Revolution is that it kind of turned violent, which is true about that. Uh, they later had this thing called the Reign of Terror, which kind of peaks around 1792 to 93, uh, where radicals like Maximilian Robespierre took over the country and they executed a lot of people that were against the revolution. So you get all this period where there's kind of this terror, you know, Reign of Terror that kind of uh, comes in the country. It's kind of been sometimes compared to later the uh, Soviet Union, like the Red Terror, you know, Joseph Stalin, you know, and all that. Uh, and so they do have kind of violent phases of the revolution that they, they go through uh, as well. Now, I'll talk about later, the end of the revolution. Of course, Napoleon will also seize power uh, as well. So anyway, uh, I'm going to first talk about, of course, today, uh, a little bit about who was the monarch uh, at the time. Of course, you've got here... Louis the Louis the uh, 16th, you see there on the left, uh, and then on the right is his wife, of course, Queen Marie Antoinette. Uh, Louis the 16th was the fifth Bourbon monarch. Uh, he was actually the grandson of Louis the 15th, who had been the king previously uh, from 1715 to 1774. I think they mentioned him in the in that little short video on Marie Antoinette, how he died young. Uh, actually, well, I think he did die young. I think of I think it was smallpox, and then he had a son I'll get to later called the Dauphin uh, that was supposed to be the ruler. He died of tuberculosis. Uh, and uh, anyway, a lot of people believe that uh, part of why the French Revol Revolution happened was because of the fact that Louis XVI was kind of seen as inept, uh, too young uh, to come in and reign. Uh, he was only a teenager when uh, he came to power. Uh, in 1774. Uh, they think he had like poor leadership skills. Uh, he was indecisive. Uh, a lot of people believe he was incompetent. Uh, and so a lot, a, lot of, a lot of historians seem to think that that kind of played a role, part of why the revolution you know, broke out uh, in the beginning. I think if, if they had been a more decisive ruler, more competent ruler, uh, like say maybe Louis XIV, basically as monarch, you might not have seen the revolution go uh, the way it was. Uh, he did have this father, like I said, uh, named Louis uh, the Dauphin of France, who had been uh, the heir to the throne uh, since the 1720s. Uh, he was the one that was supposed to be uh, the monarch, uh, but he, he died young uh, and so never got it. And so it went to his son, which would be the grandson of Louis the 15th. Uh, he's an interesting figure, uh, the Dauphin of Louis uh, he actually had three sons that would be the kings of France, which is true. Louis the Sixteenth, of course, uh, the first one, and he had two younger brothers also that were Louis the Eighteenth uh, and Charles the Tenth. Uh, that will reign later. Uh, this will be after uh, Napoleon's exile uh, in the 1800s. So yeah, they they do have a lot of you know later later Bourbon rulers, uh, but there's not too many more after that. There's really only two other rulers after that. Uh, Louis the 18th and Charles the 10th. Charles the 10th was the last Bourbon monarch, of course, uh, of France. Uh, of course, on the right, uh, you can see he married Marie Antoinette. 
who was one of the daughters of uh, Empress Maria Theresa, you know, of the Austrian Empire. Uh, and um, she came to France at a very young age. I think her real name was Maria Antonia. Uh, and uh, the only thing about uh, Marie Antoinette, she was not very popular. A lot of people hated uh, Marie Antoinette. Uh, they even called her nasty nicknames. Uh, they kind of saw her as a spendthrift and part of why France uh, had so many problems uh, with the country. And um, they called her names like Madame Deficit, I think was one nickname they called her because when France got in a lot of debt, they blamed her for it because uh, they saw her as a spendthrift, you know, spending a lot of lavishly on uh, things like that, fancy hairdos and fancy balls and uh, et cetera. I think later when uh, Louis XVI could like veto like legislation, uh, they remarked that it was probably her that was influencing him to veto uh, bills or whatever. So they called her Madame Vito uh, was another name. Uh, also, they, they thought, of course, she was German, you know, Austrian. Uh, so they called her the Austrian bitch, uh, believe it or not. Uh, and then I think at the beginning of, of the reign, uh, when they had trouble having children, uh, they blamed her for it. Um, they called her a lesbian, uh, which I think the French word was la trabade, I think was what they dubbed her uh, in French. And uh, as you know, later, uh, Marie Antoinette, um, there's a famous saying, you know, that's attributed to her that goes back to the French Revolution, which is let them eat cake. Uh, you probably heard of, uh, and um, I suppose it was a, saying that was attributed to her when French peasants were starving and didn't have enough bread. And so she simply said, oh, just let them eat cake instead, uh, basically. But they don't think she really ever said it. That's one of the weird things about uh, Marie Antoinette. Uh, and um, there's actually this, um, I think I've talked about it before, but remember Jean-Jacques Rousseau uh, had this autobiography that he wrote uh, that was called The Confessions of uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, uh, which I think was considered one of the first popular uh, autobiographies to come out in Europe. Uh, he had a, actually had a quotation in there. It was kind of similar to it that said, at length, I remembered the last resort of a great princess who, when told that the peasants had no bread, she replied, then let them eat brioche. Uh, and brioche is like a type of fancy bread that has eggs in it, and raisins and things like that. I think some people put rum in it or something like that, from alcohol. Uh, and that maybe is what she's really talking about. But yeah, she was not very popular. And I think also because she was like foreign, like Austrian. Austrian France had been for years enemies. You know about that. So yeah, France was in crisis. Uh, the monarchy uh, was really kind of out of touch with the average, you know, person in France. Which average uh, person in France was a peasant that was mostly dealing with agriculture and things like that. And France was still a feudal country, uh, like a lot of countries were uh, in the 18th century. And uh, it was made worse by a lot of famines and the lack of food uh, in the country. And so that kind of helped to cause the people to want to riot later as a whole. And then the middle class didn't have any political rights and they wanted more power uh, also uh, as well. And you can see the Dutch Revolution was, they think, another phase. They think that may have caused it. Because uh, they were behind the British. The British Empire was rising in power and becoming industrialized, and France was behind uh, at the time. So that's Marie Antoinette. So yeah, she she they they married very young, uh, you know. When they when, of course they got, and that may have been part of the problem was the, that fact. Uh, now they talk about this other issue that you know, is very famous uh, in the. Um, uh, French, uh, what may have caught, they think caused the French Revolution, which is the Little Ice Age. I don't know if you have heard about this, but there's a theory that climate change, believe it or not, <laughs> may have caused the, the French Revolution. Because uh, I think there was a time in uh, early, early uh, modern history where there was kind of this uh, kind of a cooling period uh, that occurred uh, throughout, throughout Europe and I guess part of the Northern Hemisphere that they had. And it caused a lot of crop failures where they had like a lot of famines, uh, like in countries like France, as an example. Uh, and so there were shortages of food, a lot of disease and things like that uh, that were occurring. And um, they say that the average temperature uh, actually dropped uh, throughout Europe. And before that, they had this so-called medieval warm period uh, that occurred 
uh, kind of in the high of the late Middle Ages. And then there was a cooling period that occurred, uh, kind of like starting maybe around the end of the Middle Ages, early, early modern times. And it actually caused like colder temperatures in the year. Well, like they actually had deals where uh, I think they had, uh, if you look at pictures right here, uh, they had cases where rivers like froze over when they never did. Uh, and uh, I think examples of that was like in uh, England, uh, like the Thames River actually froze over, uh, which is kind of a rare thing uh, in history. And um, there was actually this man named uh, Francois Mathis, uh, who uh, in the 1930s actually coined the term Little Ice Age. And uh, I think he put forth different theories about it, about why this cooling period happened. But uh, I think there's some of the main theories is that uh, they think it had to do with volcanic eruptions uh, that kind of occurred around that time. I know in Iceland, they had that happen uh, as an example of volcanic eruption there that may have caused it. Uh, or maybe the sun just wasn't putting out as much heat, uh, you know, things like that. Uh, so there's different theories on on why why actually the little ice age happened, but it may have it may have caused indirectly you know the the, the French Revolution to occur. Now one of the main things that really caused the decline they think of the of of really uh, the French Empire is the Seven Years War uh, that breaks out, uh, and uh, the Seven Years War um, was one of the main military they think. Uh, conflicts that really caused the French Empire to decline in the 18th century. And a lot of it had to do with the fact that the British Empire was starting to become a major power uh, in Europe and the world. And they lost a lot of massive defeats to them, uh, losing most of their, you know, North American, you know, possessions, colonies. And uh, they believed that the uh, it was caused by the diplomatic revolution that I talked about before, where you had the switching of the alliances. Uh, where Britain uh, switched to be allied with, with Prussia, and I think also Hanover as well. So you have these German states that kind of align with each other uh, in Europe. And the Austrians align with the French uh, as well. And you get other countries like Spain, which is also Bourbon, aligned with the French, and also the Russians uh, align with Austria and France and Spain uh, as well. And of those four main ones you're looking at, uh, they sometimes call it another nickname you may have heard of called the Stately Quadrille. That was actually the nickname of this new alliance that formed, which had to do with uh, the so-called quadrille dance that was kind of popular in Europe at the time where dance partners would switch all the time and things like that. And so that's that's how the alliance, you know, came about with that. Now, um, kind of looking at this map here of different parts of the world where the Seven Years' War, of course, was fought. Uh, they think part of, there's different theories on how the war broke out. There's like two main events that really they think sparked it. Uh, in Europe, they had Frederick the Great, who we talked about before, uh, Kingdom of Prussia. They, he actually invaded Saxony, which was kind of like next to Silesia, more to the west uh, in Germany. And he actually took it uh, from uh, Maria Theresa, her possessions, of course, of Habsburg's Holy Roman Empire. And uh, that, that sparked the war in Europe. And so he had a bunch of countries like France, uh, Austria, Sweden, I think in Russia, uh, that at one point would attack Prussia. And Prussia, you know, fearful of being, you know, overtaken uh, in Europe, aligned with the British, uh, basically, which made more sense because Britain was ruled by the Hanover dynasty. And so that's why that kind of happened anyway. Uh, the other thing that happened too, was that France and Britain tangled over North American possessions, uh, the Great Lakes area, uh, and also ca Eastern Canada uh, at the time. They fought this conflict that they called in America the French and Indian War, uh, which actually lasted the longest of the different conflicts. They called it that because both sides had you know, Indian allies uh, that were in the war. And uh, both were fighting really to control the fur trade. Uh, in parts of North America, which was important for, to both really economies of those countries. Uh, and so, yeah, that had a lot to do with it. Uh, and that, that was really the thing that really caused the do, uh, decline of the um, you know French Empire is really more of the French and Indian War. You can see you can see here one thing about the Seven Years War uh, that's very interesting. It is one of the first world wars uh, that breaks out, uh, especially between the European powers and 
you can see where all those lines are. Those are areas where the most of the conflict was about. Uh, Central Europe, obviously, in the middle. Uh, North America, the eastern part of it, you know, Canada, eastern part of the United States area later. And also, don't forget India, too. Uh, they kind of fought for control of. And they're also, I think, fighting with the Caribbean uh, as well. But those are the main areas that they were really into. Uh, the British, what they did eventually between especially 1758 to 1760, the British launched a major campaign to try and seize eastern Canada. Uh, and uh, it, the most important aspect of it uh, was the fall of this important force, fortress that was called Fortress Lewisburg, which is up there uh, close to the Gulf of St. Lawrence. Uh, and uh, that, that actual... Um, fortress was important because it guarded the entrance to the Gulf of St. Lawrence. So any ship, you know, going through there, we get blasted by, by cannon. And so uh, the British landed troops on there and seized it. Uh, and uh, that was considered really the turning point in the whole French and Indian War. And they had this uh, general uh, that was named uh, James Wolfe. He was able to uh, get forces down uh, the St. Lawrence River. Uh, and after a siege, I think, which lasts like something like two, three months uh, of Quebec, uh, what happened was on September 13th, uh, British forces stormed the heights of Quebec and they defeated the French forces there. Uh, so called Battle of the Plains of Abraham, and sometimes called, some people call it the Battle of Quebec uh, as well. And so that, they consider that battle to be really the most strategic battle, really, of the whole Seven Years' War, uh, because the British end up seizing, you know, Quebec and all of pretty much Eastern Canada uh, after that. Uh, weird thing about that battle, uh, Wolfe died in the battle, though. And I think the general on the other side, his name was Louis Montcalm. He got killed, too. So both generals got killed. <laughs> it's kind of weird. Uh, but the British end up winning anyway. Now, here's kind of a map showing you uh, right here. But uh, basically, after the uh, Treaty of Paris, uh, what ends up happening in 1763, uh, the British end up with all that territory uh, in the eastern part of North America, uh, pretty much uh, where the United States will be all the way to the Mississippi River and also what is now eastern Canada at the time. So all that goes to them. And then Spain will get the western part, uh, basically, of the... British wanted uh, Spanish Florida uh, to, you know, control that eastern part of North America. And so they did a swap. And the British gave Louisiana uh, to the Spanish. The Spanish gave uh, Britain uh, Florida. And so they did a swap there. And that's basically how that came about. So, yeah, there it is right there, 763, uh, basically. That's the main thing. And so um, <laughs> French get nothing out of this, of course. Uh, they lose all their North American uh, possessions, which was really a big, big blow uh, to the French Empire. I think the only thing they kept after that was really, um, I think they got to keep like islands in the Caribbean, you know, like St. Domain or something like that, Haiti. Uh, but that was, that was about it. Uh, so they lost India too, because uh, after that, the British start taking over India uh, as well. Uh, now another major thing that they think caused the, the French Revolution later, believe it or not, was the American Revolutionary War, American Revolution, as we called it. So we call it the American War for Independence uh, as well. So yeah, it's, it's a major call, so, uh, which a lot of it had to do with really uh, one of two things, I guess, that they think led to the French Revolution later. Uh, one was uh, the French uh, incurred a lot of debt uh, from the war, uh, which I'll kind of talk about later about that. But that, that was something they did. And uh, the French uh, fought Britain against with backing with Americans because of the fact that they wanted to get back at Britain because uh, they had lost in the Seven Years' War. They didn't really get much out of it, though. That's the only thing about it. Uh, and um, I think they got re really a revolution because uh, a lot of Americans, that, a lot of the French that fought in the American Revolutionary War uh, were heavily influenced by it you know, because of the fact, fact they were fighting for you know, democracy, liberty, uh, the right of self-government and things like that. And that, that really helped to basically cause uh, the French Revolution later. Uh, and um, the uh, French began to support uh, 
George Washington, uh, who, uh, of course, develops the so-called Continental Army uh, that they'll, they'll develop when the uh, 13 colonies, you know, break from, from uh, the mother country of Britain. Uh, they think that a lot of the cause of why the American Revolution broke out uh, was because of uh, uh, strong uh, policies that were put put by the Parliament on uh, on the on the thirteen colonies, which uh, a lot of it had to do with the uh, debts owed from the Seven Years' War, the French and Indian War, and so they put heavy taxes on them. You know about this, and so later it created this patriot movement uh, in uh, America that caused the the American Revolution to break out in 1775. Uh, Washington, who was a um, veteran of the French and Indian War, uh, would later lead, if you know about this, the American forces in the war. Uh, he, of course, was from Virginia and later, of course, the first president of the United States. Uh, the French, by about 1777, would then start aiding George Washington's uh, forces uh, they're kind of important because um, the French, because French military support had a lot to do with why the Americans won the war. Uh, in fact, a combination of French military support, especially naval support, main thing, I think, uh, helped to bottle up General Cornwallis' forces at the Siege of Yorktown, in October 1791 in Virginia. Uh, and so that, that kind of played a role uh, in why the Americans would defeat you know, the British, and the British would have to recognize, of course, the United States of America, uh, which it formed in 1776. So that was definitely a major turning point, of course, with American history for later. Uh, and uh, But there are a lot of Frenchmen that went over there and fought. Uh, of course, the most famous you see there is Marquis de Lafayette. If you know about Louisiana, we've got a lot of places named after him, like towns or whatever, Lafayette or buildings or schools, uh, et cetera. He is like one of several uh, Frenchmen that went over there early to uh, back uh, the United States. But it wasn't just him. Uh, he had also Comte de Rochambeau was another soldier uh, that was involved uh, as well. He was a marshal of France that was involved in the war. Admiral de Grasse, of course, was another one uh, who pretty much led the French Navy. Uh, and um, close to about 12,000 French troops uh, helped. Washington win the war. They say, I was looking it up, uh, 22,000 naval personnel uh, were also used. Uh, over 60 French naval ships were involved, too, in helping to defeat the British. Uh, so uh, they were definitely involved in why, basically, you know, the American Revolution was excess uh, overall. So, yeah, here's kind of a picture showing the Treaty of Paris, 1783, how the United States is formed. You can see pretty much it goes all the way to the Mississippi River at that point. So the British lost all that territory, you know, that, of course, that we saw from the French and Indian War. Eventually, the United States is going to go all the way to, of course, to California uh, over time. Manifest destiny. All right. Now, I'm going to get into today, of course, I'll get more into uh, the French Revolution. Uh, of course, how it breaks out in 1789. Um, there's different reasons why the revolution broke out. I'll kind of get more into uh, today. Uh, one was the fact that French society was not equal. It was unequal. Uh, in fact, they called it a nickname. It was called the ancient regime. It's what people called it, which means like old regime in French. And uh, that's what they call the political social system of France, where a lot of the upper classes controlled everything. And uh, the upper classes had control of like the land, uh, they had all the political power, uh, they had all the privileges in the country, uh, they even had control over the Catholic Church uh, as well, the military, you know, most of the generals, you know, were all from the upper class and things like that, and so you were a lower class, you really had no rights or anything uh, as much, and uh, going back to medieval times, the French divided the people into three social classes, uh, they were often called the estates or I think the other long name, if you want, is the Estates of the Realm. Uh, and um, this is something that went back to medieval times because a long time ago, they used to say there were three kinds of people, basically, those that prayed, uh, those that uh, fought, and those that worked. And so the ones that are at the top were the ones that pretty much prayed and fought. <clears throat> uh, and that would be the clergy, uh, which is the first estate, 
Uh, and then the second estate was the nobility. Uh, so those were the two. And they didn't make up much of a population. There's a few percentage, basically, that, you know, made it up. And uh, you can see the nobility controlled about 20% of the land. And then the rest was pretty much controlled uh, by either the, the king or the church uh, and all that. I guess some people might own land uh, in the lower classes, but not much. Because uh, a lot of that was a part of the feudal system that was kind of going on still uh, in France. Uh, the third estate was made up of different peoples. Uh, they had what they call the bourgeoisie, uh, which was the upper middle class, uh, which in France they had a nickname uh, for the bourgeoisie. Uh, they were called the culottes. Uh, the culottes were like this uh, type of class, common people uh, that were educated, uh, usually they were wealthy as well, uh, as much as some of the nobility. Uh, a lot of them might be like a, a merchant. They might be like a doctor, a lawyer, something like that, like a Voltaire or something like that, or uh, Montesquieu. I think we're all considered bourgeoisie. But um, <clears throat> I think actually, actually Montesquieu was nobility, but uh, Voltaire definitely was bourgeoisie. But um, I think Marx, Karl Marx later said that the bourgeoisie were the ones that became the capitalists later, the so-called townspeople that uh, over time uh, will eventually control the economy, uh, et cetera. And they call they call them culottes because they wore these um, types of, um, they call them like a type of pants called breeches, uh, which come down to like your uh, where your knee is. And uh, it was usually a mark of, of upper class status. Uh, and... Um, a lot of the people would also wear like powdered wigs and things like that. And uh, the bourgeoisie would dress like the nobility. Uh, urban urban lower class were the townspeople. Uh, they were like a skilled type labor. Uh, so they might own a business. Uh, they might be like a butcher, a blacksmith, a tanner, something like that, uh, where they made a living, had some kind of skill. And uh, they're considered like a lower middle class. And uh, they were often nicknamed in the French Revolution the sans culottes uh, because they didn't wear the breeches or culottes. Uh, they wore just traditional pants uh, that people wear today. Uh, and then on the bottom, you see you've got the peasants, of course, which make up most people uh, in France uh, at the time. I think the French population may have been 30, 40 million range. Uh, and um, what, what did they want? The peasants just wanted to eat. Like or have food available that was you know cheap, that kind of thing, like bread mostly. I know was the main diet of most people, most peasants. Uh, lower taxes. They also wanted to get rid of feudalism or feudal ties that were you know still there, uh, you know in, in early modern times. And so they're the reasons why the revolution kind of turns violent too, uh, as well. But really, the, the those two in the um, third estate, the bourgeoisie, uh, and the urban lower classes, they're, they're the ones that really would want more rights more than anything because, uh, you know, they're kind of like the middle class. Now, uh, talk about the early stages uh, of the revolution, which began, I'll kind of talk about Abby Sias in a second, but uh, they say the reason why the revolution broke out uh, was because of the fact that France had all this debt they had to pay uh, from the American Revolution uh, and, of course, the country was on verge of bankruptcy uh, at that point. And not many people knew about it, by the way, I think until about 1788, that the government had kind of been secretive about how much money they owed. Uh, and uh, the amount of money they owed, by the way, uh, if you want to know how much it was uh, in American dollars, uh, it was actually um, about um, not, quite a, not quite a billion dollars was how much they owed at the time. 1.3 livre, which a livre was at the time a kind of a, they call the French pound. It looked like a British pound, I guess they had in England. But um, but yeah, they owe like maybe what is now in American dollars, about 850, billion, uh, 850 million dollars that they owed. Uh, and so the king, which we talked about before, Louis the Sixteenth, uh, was forced to call uh, what they call the Estates General, uh, which I'll be talking about uh, in a second. I'll get to the National Assembly in a second about that. Uh, but the Estates General was this medieval representative assembly, which had been around uh, since like the 
Um, it went back to the um, late Middle Ages, and uh, it represented the three social classes, the estates, of course, of France. Uh, and it really didn't have any authority to actually pass laws or taxation like, say, the British Parliament did. Uh, it was more like an advisory body uh, to the monarch, and it actually had been shut down in 1614 because uh, of divine right, you know, absolutism, and so it hadn't really met in, you know, something like a hundred something years. So it'd been a while. Uh, and so what happened was the king called for this uh, parliament to meet, which met, by the way, at Versailles in the spring of 1789, and uh, about 1,200 delegates were elected. Uh, to this parliament, basically, which represented all three estates. And I think about half of them were from the third estate, uh, and then the other half were about first and second estates. And uh, what caused the actual French Revolution to break out politically uh, was the fact that the assembly, they couldn't figure out how they were going to vote, you know, as representatives, basically. And I think the king wanted them to vote by a state. But the third estate was like, we ought to vote by representatives because I think we have a lot of people. And so that that was one of the loggerheads that actually caused the whole revolution to break out was because they couldn't figure out how to, how to actually vote. Uh, what caused the thing to really blow up more was that in uh, 1789, like maybe on February, I think it was, uh, this man named Abby Siez, who was a Catholic priest uh, in Abbott, uh, published this pamphlet that was called What is the Third Estate, which became very, very popular. And uh, a lot of people saw it as like a manifesto of the revolution of which it would be. It's kind of like the Thomas Paine, maybe, of the American Revolution. He wrote Common Sense, if you remember that. Uh, so it's kind of comparable to that a little bit. Uh, but he asked a bunch of questions at the beginning of it, which were very interesting. He said, what is the Third Estate? Uh, he said everything. Uh, and because he said that because of the fact that France was the majority of the third estate, like 90 some percent, well, basically. Uh, what has it been heretofore in political order? What has it been up to politically? Nothing, because they don't have any rights. Uh, third, one, third, third, third question was, what does it demand uh, to become something? Uh, so he wants the third estate to politically be significant and have political rights and things like that. And uh, Ciaz just, he didn't just do that. He went further, uh, C.S., uh, he uh, attacked the upper classes as being, you know, having too many rights, too much power, uh, too much privilege. Uh, and he believed that the third estate ought to create its own legislative body, assembly, you know, that would represent all the French people, uh, especially the third estate. Uh, and so that's, that's really what led to eventually politically the revolution, really the beginning at that point. And so it led to the formation uh, in June of 1789, uh, the National Assembly, which the actual full name uh, is actually the National Constituent Assembly. That's what the French called it, uh, although they kind of shortened it later to National Assembly. It's kind of too long of a name, I think. Uh, anyway, they think it's the thing that really effectively you know, begins the revolution. And they would first meet on June 17th. 1789, uh, where all the delegates would come. And they also got, they asked like anybody that was in the first or second estate uh, could join. Uh, so like in the first estate, Abby C.S. joined it. Uh, second estate, uh, Marquis de Lafayette, who was kind of involved early in the revolution, also joined it uh, as well. So it wasn't just the third estate that was involved. Uh, he had some nobility that backed it and clergy and things like that uh, to, I guess, demand change at that point. Uh, you know what happened? Uh, the king, Louis XVI, tried to lock them out of their meeting room at Versailles. Uh, and so they went to this nearby tennis court, like a, I think it's a squash court, I think they call it at the time. It was like racquetball, really more. They meet in this tennis court. Uh, and on June 20th, 1789, they all take an oath basically to, uh, they said they would basically form a constitution for France, which, you know, France didn't have at that time. Uh, and uh, it would take them like a couple of years to, to write a constitution, but that was their, their main uh, oath that they would take. Uh, this painting, by the way, is very famous. It was done later by 
Jacques Louis David, who uh, did a lot of paintings of the French Revolution, age of Napoleon, kind of romanticizes it you know, a lot. That's actually Abby Sias in white there taking the oath. You can see kind of in the middle on the left, um, he's kind of involved in it. And they say he's one of the main figures that's kind of behind the beginning of the revolution. Uh, and uh, here's the actual oath. About 578 delegates actually signed it and took the oath. Uh, the National Assembly, considering that it has been summoned to establish the Constitution of the Kingdom, decrees that all members of the Assembly shall immediately take a solemn oath not to separate until the Constitution of the Kingdom is established on firm foundations, uh, which they didn't have one anyway. Uh, the King was the Constitution before. And so they were promising to, you know, like I said, create a Constitution. Now, um, what would happen next? That's the political beginning of the revolution. Now, there was fear that the king would shut the revolution down, like these reforms that they're starting to do uh, at that time uh, overall. And, uh, and so what happened was uh, with the formation of the National Assembly going on, the thing turned violent. <clears throat> if you know about that, the revolution uh, in July of 1789, and... Um, they would storm this thing called the Bastille uh, on July 14, 1789. Uh, what was the Bastille? Uh, the Bastille was a French political prison and army that was a, basically a symbol of the Bourbon regime, uh, which was in Paris. Uh, it had, by the way, held a lot of political prisoners in there, including Voltaire. Voltaire had been in prison in the Bastille uh, at one point. And so it was a major symbol of tyranny, a uh, major symbol of absolutism, things like that. Uh, and so uh, the people stormed it. Uh, and um, uh, if you know about uh, the storming of the Bastille, um, there were actually about, I forget how the number of guards that were involved. I think it was like 114 soldiers were actually guarding it. Uh, and uh, anyway, uh, there was a, a nobleman named Marquis de Launay uh, he was actually one of the first to be killed uh, in the revolution. They killed him and then they cut his head off and put it on a pike. Uh, and then uh, part of why they stormed it was because of the fact that it had a lot of weapons in it, you know, gunpowder and rifles and cannon they could use against the regime. And uh, after, after they stormed it, uh, the French people later tore it down, like stone by stone, you know, all that. Uh, and so it's not there anymore in Paris. They tore it down. Uh, and so, yeah, the storming of the Bastille, that's considered to be a cornerstone, uh, of course, French nationalism, of course, later. Um, part, part of they say why it happened was because uh, Louis XVI had this finance minister uh, that was named Jacques Necker, who was, I think, Swiss-French. And he was the only one, I think, in the cabinet of Louis XVI's government that favored um, some kind of tax reform, where they might tax the upper classes instead of the lower classes, which they were doing. Uh, and um, so I guess it was fear that it was going to happen. And I think there was a rumor that he got fired because of Marie Antoinette, <laughs> basically. Uh, and so that's why they stormed it. You know, it was because of that. And I think they had put him back in, but uh, after that, it was just too late, uh, basically. So yeah, here's images. They've done a lot of paintings, of course, uh, of the storming of the Bastille, but basically citizens, uh, even soldiers, switch sides to back the revolution uh, in France at that point. And uh, there was a case where I think they came to the king and they uh, he asked, it, um, is it a revolt? Or something like that was the comment that Louis XVI said. And, no, sire, it's a revolution, uh, was the reply. So, so the revolution breaks out at that point. Uh, the French later have this celebration that they, of course, create out of it uh, in later modern times. Uh, which became a holiday in 1880, uh, which was created by this uh, politician, French politician named Benjamin Raspail. And of course, that was the so-called birth of Bastille Day, uh, which is kind of like a national day of France, uh, where they kind of celebrate, you know, French unity and all that. It's kind of comparable to uh, our 4th of July, you know, where they have parades and fireworks and things like that. And they parade down the Champs to the way, of course, uh, in uh, Paris, uh, the capital, you know, like military parades and things like that. And I think even sometimes the United States will even have like some troops parade with it 
uh, things like that. And so that's a, that's a big thing, you know, uh, in France uh, that they have. So yeah, it's comparable to sometimes the the Fourth of July celebration we have for uh, our our country for American independence. All right, I'm going to talk about next some of the stages uh, of the revolution because the revolution kind of goes through, uh, kind of starts out moderately uh, doing like reforms the state, and then over time it gets kind of radical and crazy. I'll kind of get into that, and uh, they have what they call the Great Fear. Uh, that occurs like around the about the summer fall is about when it breaks out and uh, what the great fear was a rebellion where all the people kind of got involved in it uh, and uh, he had a deal where uh, even the peasants get involved the peasants actually will attack the nobility throughout the country uh, people get rioting because there's not enough food uh, throughout the country uh, there's even uh, this case where women march on Versailles uh, and um, so you have this whole thing, and it's like a mass hysteria uh, throughout the country. And you have even deals where the peasants formed these uh, mobs of peasants. I think they called them brigands, and they went around attacking nobility and their their uh, their land and stuff like that. And I think it even forces um, some Frenchmen to flee the country as emigres. They they actually leave leave uh, the country uh, and all that. Uh, and um, and I've got like a kind of a map showing it right here, but you can see how it spreads throughout the country. So it you know, first started in Paris and Versailles, and the next thing you know, it's all over the place. I think July, August was the peak of it, of the great fear uh, and all that. And um, it got so bad that what happened was uh, the Women's March occurred uh, by the early fall in October, and uh, you had cases where the French stormed the Palace of Versailles too as well. They broke into it uh, and they basically seized the uh, Louis the 16th and his wife Marie Antoinette uh, and they forced them to live in Paris. And so they were forced to abandon uh, you know reigning from uh, Versailles, which they had done since you know Louis the 14th's reign uh, and all that. And I think they mentioned it how they would uh, be put in what is called the Twil Tuileries Palace, you know, the Tuileries Palace, uh, which is a palace which is part of the it was, used to be part of the Louvre, uh, but it burned down. Uh, what would happen after that? Then the National Assembly would start making all these reforms to the country, which at first they were kind of like moderate type reforms uh, that were created in the country. Uh, they actually came out with this thing called the August Decrees. Uh, what was that? These were a bunch of decrees uh, by the National Assembly, which ended a bunch of things in the country, like all the rights and privileges of the nobility, was gotten rid of. So there would be no longer separate social classes. Everybody would be what they call a citizen. This is the term they start using. It's kind of clear like comrade, because they use later, like the communists had later. Um, serfdom was abolished. Uh, they, they abolished feudalism as well. Uh, they didn't, uh, a lot of the peasants, lower classes, uh, didn't have to pay church tithes uh, to the Catholic church. So all those were things that were made overnight uh, in France in August of 1789. Uh, also, August 26, uh, the Assembly adopted uh, what is the Declaration of the Rights of Man uh, and the Citizen. Uh, what that did uh, was it gave all male citizens equal rights, which uh, did not include women, by the way, which kind of a sad thing at the time, but most women wouldn't really get any rights equally until almost the 20th century, maybe a little later uh, when that is. And um, the actual um, Declaration of the Rights of Man was drafted by several men, they think. They think Abby Siez and Marquis de Lafayette were the main ones that were mostly behind it. Uh, and they say that they believe that Thomas Jefferson uh, who at the time was a diplomat uh, in Paris when the revolution broke out, they think he may have helped consult them in, in the writing of it. And so they think uh, his Declaration of Independence, which he wrote in 1776, was kind of influential on it. But they think it was also influenced by like Voltaire, uh, Rousseau, and likely the uh, English Bill of Rights. <clears throat> so those are kind of some of the things that kind of influenced it uh, more or less uh, overall. 
Uh, also, the French began to adopt a slogan during the revolution, which became famous. Uh, it was liberty, uh, equality, uh, fraternity, which fraternity has to do with the brotherhood of mankind uh, or men and that thing, you know, men being equal, uh, things like that. And of course, one of the most famous things they started to use uh, in the French Revolution is the so-called French tricolor, uh, their, their, their national flag, uh, which you see right here, which is blue, white, and red. Uh, and so that, that becomes traditionally the main flag over time that France will adopt, and they replace that. Um, I think previously they had some kind of bourbon flag that was used uh, by, the, by the French monarchy. Uh, that became the traditional flag that they, of course, will use from there on out. I think Napoleon starts using a lot too uh, when he takes over France and Europe uh, as well. Uh, now, the other thing, I'll, I'll get to the Jacobins in a second, but I want to talk about uh, some of the different you know, reforms that were made uh, in the country at this point. Uh, one of the main things that happened after uh, they declared the Declaration of Rights of Man and all these reforms, uh, they did eventually adopt a, a, an actual constitution, which took them a while to do that, uh, almost like two years uh, to hammer it out. And it formed a constitutional monarchy. That's what the French decided that they would keep with Louis the 16th as like a figurehead. And it would have a unicameral assembly, which they called it at that point. It was called the Legislative Assembly, which would be around for about one year. And under this uh, assembly, uh, the uh, Legislative Assembly would control all the laws, the taxation, things like that. And the king had limited powers. He was a limited monarchy. But he did have one thing that was true, that he had power-wise. He had what they call a suspension veto, uh, where he could sometimes veto like bills or laws. And that kind of just made it worse for him. Uh, because when he would veto something that was against the revolution, it would make him look bad. And so people thought he was a traitor and that kind of thing. Then they also accused his wife of being behind it. And so they called her Madame Vito. Uh, you remember about that. Uh, what made it worse was that uh, Louis the Sixteenth, uh, then in June of 1791, decided to flee the country. <laughs> yeah, he and his family. It was called the Flight to Varennes. They sometimes nickname it. Uh, in the French Revolution. And so in June of 1791, uh, they left, they tried to leave the country uh, in disguise. I think Louis and his wife dressed as servants, and the servants dressed as them, <laughs> that kind of thing. But they were caught halfway to the um, border with the Netherlands, Austria and Netherlands, which is where Luxembourg and Belgium would be. And they were caught. And uh, after that, they were seen as traitors to the revolution. And so uh, that that after that the whole monarchy went downhill, and so people start talking about putting in at that point uh, a republic. Uh, and part of what leads to it uh, is the legislative assembly. They had uh, different political groups that were in it, but the most notorious uh, that rose to power was the so-called Jacobins, as you may have heard about. Uh, the Jacobins were kind of a left-wing or radical type political party that kind of emerged uh, during the French Revolution, although it was really more like a political club uh, than an actual political party that we think of, say, in Britain or the United States. And uh, it was actually not one party. It was actually made up of different factions, which I'll give you the two main ones that were in it. The two main ones was you had one side that was called the Girondists, which were more moderate. And yeah, the Montanards, which were called the mountain or mountain men, um, were more radical, more to the left of them. And um, many of them, like the Montanards, uh, favored eliminating the monarchy and putting in a republic. And um, I'll get more into it later, but one of their founders of the Jacobins was Maximilian Robespierre, you see at the top right there, who was a, a French lawyer and later dictator of France. And uh, over time, they're going to take over the country, uh, Maximilian, and they'll, they'll create the so-called reign of terror, which is more of the radical phase uh, of the revolution. And actually, they weren't called Jacobins originally. They were called the Society of the Friends of the Constitution because uh, they formed originally because they backed the idea of a France having a constitution, you know, going back to 1789. Uh, and um, 
they got the name Jacobins because they met at this uh, monastery in Paris that had that name, and so the name stuck, uh, being used later. Uh, they did have a motto, which was live free or die. Uh, so that kind of summed up uh, their movement uh, and all of that. Uh, another thing about the Legislative Assembly I did want to talk about, uh, which is kind of famous if you study about the French Revolution, uh, the whole right, whole left-right uh, political spectrum, you hear like left versus right and that kind of thing, it actually starts in this uh, assembly uh, that they have. Because uh, what ends up happening is the people that are more liberal or more radical sit on the left, uh, and then the ones that are more moderate sit in the center, uh, and then the ones that are more conservative sit on the right. Uh, and so that's where that came from, that whole left-right spectrum that you have. And so the Montanards were more way to the left, left side. And they were sometimes called a mountain because they sat high up on the left. And that's where the name comes from, the mountain or mountain men also as well. Uh, before the uh, Jacobins really seized control of the state, though, totally, uh, they had the Tuileries Palace is actually stormed uh, in August of 1792. Uh, and the French decide to get rid of the monarchy at that point. And so France in the fall of 1792 declares a republic. And so so-called First French Republic forms at that point. And they later have a new parliament they create again. Uh, that's called the National Convention, uh, which will control the country for about three years, uh, from 1792 to 95. But really, I'll get to it later, Robespierre is the one that really takes it over. It becomes like a dictatorship. And they have this thing called the Committee of Public Safety that controls the whole country more than anything. But yeah, um, I'll get more into it, but the revolution is going to really turn violent. Uh, you know, in, in France, uh, you know, these, the, the formation of the French Republic, it sparks a bunch of wars uh, throughout Europe, which are known as the French Revolutionary Wars, which will go on for about 10 years uh, until Napoleon takes it over and becomes the Napoleonic Wars <laughs> that you have later. But you get all these countries in Europe, like Austria, Prussia, Britain, Russia, Spain, uh, they all declare war on, on France because they're fearful that this French Revolution is going to overthrow their monarchies. And so that's why that occurs, of course, in, 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 uh, with, with the French. And uh, I think for a while at first it looked like the revolution was going to get shut down uh, because Prussia decided that they were going to invade uh, and try to you know, help, I guess, Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette uh, with the Austrians. Austrians like backing them and all that, uh, but they were actually beaten at the Battle of Valme uh, in September of 1792, and so they are unable to really save them, uh, the royal family, and they later end up getting executed uh, via the guillotine, of course, you're looking at. That's one of the things I wanted to talk about uh, that's real famous, you know, about, about you know, the, the French Revolution. Uh, is the guillotine. The guillotine really becomes the most famous symbol of the whole, not just the French Revolution, but the reign of terror. Uh, the guillotine was a, a type of invention uh, that was actually created uh, to make execution more humane, uh, which uh, before that, when you were executed, uh, they would have all kinds of methods. Uh, like if you were lower classes, it might be hanging, uh, it might be uh, drawn and quartered, uh, you know, things like that <clears throat> might be ways. Burn the stake. Uh, no, nobility were usually decapitated, like with an axe usually, maybe a sword at the worst. Uh, but there are just different methods that, that really were just not equal among the French <clears throat> and all that. And um, apparently there was a, a physician that was under Louis XVI. His name was Antoine Louis. He was the actual man uh, that would invent it. He invented the actual guillotine or guillotine, uh, as it's called also. Kind of ironic, later in the revolution, during the reign of terror, he would actually be executed by his own invention. That's kind of the funny thing about that. Uh, that'll be later. But um, so, yeah, yeah, um, they think it was invented around maybe or, or completed about 1792, uh, the actual guillotine. It was first used on prisoners. Uh, in that year. 
And uh, part of why it's called guillotine was because it was named after this other doctor named Dr. Joseph Guillotine. And um, he was a big supporter of it. He was a delegate to the assembly. Uh, and so he thought it should be used, you know, in France as the main form of execution. And so that became basically what they used for everybody. So everybody would get the same execution, no matter who they are, wealthy or poor, that kind of thing. Uh, they even uh, tried to nickname it different things like um, Lucette, Lusatine, Luzon. I think were all nicknames where they tried to name it after the inventor, uh, Dr. Antoine Louis. Uh, but they thought it was too close to the king's name, you know, like Louis the Sixteenth. A lot of people called it as a nickname, the National Razor. Uh, and so that was kind of a name that everybody called it. And it's crazy. They used it up to 1977. Uh, kind of joke about it sometimes, but that was the same year Star Wars came out, the original movie. So they were still using it for almost 200 years. Crazy. Uh, the Germans had something similar to it. It was called the Fall, uh, I think it was called the Fall Bell, Falling Axe or something like that. They think it was influenced from German designs. Uh, those are some statistics on the guillotine. You can see it was very heavy, almost weighing 1,300 pounds. Uh, the average blade uh, was almost 90 pounds. Wow. So imagine that coming, to, on, on, coming down on the back of your, you know, your neck. Uh, the high of the side posts were about 14 feet tall. Uh, the blade drop was almost 90 inches uh, from top to bottom. It fell at a rate of about 21 feet per second, or 1 70th a second, they believe. Uh, it only took about 200 of a second for the actual your head to be cut off. That's how fast it was. If you blinked or you, you, you looked away, you would miss it. The guy getting his head cut off. Uh, power and impact was about 888 pounds per square inch. Wow. Um, and, of course, a lot of people immediately will lose consciousness and die. Uh, but they, if you know about it, when people would get their head cut off, they would still have reflexes where they'd move their hands or arms. And I think they say their eyes would keep blinking afterwards as well after you got your head cut off. Uh, now, there are famous people that were killed by it, by the way, I'll uh, kind of mention about. Uh, but um, yeah, these three were the most famous that were executed via guillotine. Uh, Louis XVI, of course, was executed on January 21st. 1793. Uh, Marie Antoinette, October 16th, 1793. Of course, they talked about that in a little short video. Uh, Maximilian Rosemary was also executed too in July 28th of 1794 as well. So those are some of the famous ones that were executed by via uh, guillotine. Uh, also, uh, I'll kind of talk briefly about Jean-Paul Marat. You may have heard of him. He was a big martyr of the French Revolution. Uh, he was actually killed uh, on um, July 13th of 1793. He was actually murdered, and he was actually sitting in his bathtub uh, taking a bath because he had this horrible skin illness that he had, uh, and uh, we had to take baths all the time. And he was actually killed by this woman named Charlotte Corday, uh, who uh, was more of a Girondist supporter. I think Marat was more supportive of the Montanards and Robespierre, who was more radical, and he had this newspaper he called that was called the Friend of the People, which really supported the whole Jacobin causes and all that. And Marat was really a bloodthirsty editor of his paper. He would often put quotations in it like, in order to ensure public tranquility, 200,000 heads must be cut off. Uh, and so just that kind of stuff being put in papers. And um, his death was later, they made a famous painting of it by Jean-Jacques Louis David. Uh, the Death of Marat, probably one of the most famous paintings ever done uh, of the French Revolution. And um, Corday was later found guilty of it, killing, killing, um, of killing uh, Marat. And she was also sent to the guillotine uh, also as well. But Marat became like this big, you know, martyr of the whole cause. And that's, that's part of why uh, Marie Antoinette was eventually executed. She was kind of blamed for it. Uh, she was put on trial, uh, and then later it, it led to her execution in October 1793. And there's, there's a famous story about uh, when she went to get executed. Uh, she supposedly accidentally stepped on the executioner's foot, one that, I guess, pulls down the uh, guillotine. 
she said something like, I didn't mean to step on your foot, <laughs> basically. I didn't do it on purpose or something like that. That's what she said. So kind of a tragic story about her, of course, being uh, executed. Uh, then what happened was uh, the, um, I was talking about how, um, what happened, uh, the uh, Jacobins then took over the country, if you know about that, between 1793 to 94, starting like the so-called reign of terror, uh, where they went after people that were against the revolution. And Robespierre uh, formed a dictatorship that was called the Committee of Public Safety. Uh, and uh, it was this 12-man committee that basically uh, had control over the country. They kind of suspended the Constitution for a while uh, as well. And they tried to root out enemies of the state. Uh, and so they think that anywhere from like 40,000 or more uh, people in France were actually killed by the Jacobins. They were either executed via guillotine. Some were even just killed in prison like that uh, as well. And it was kind of this counter-revolutionary movement to try to prevent the revolution from being overthrown uh, internally. And so that's why the guillotine, you know, starts to be used a lot uh, throughout the country. And um, one of the things he did that's very, very famous was the Jacobins started doing a lot of radical reforms to the country, uh, which were later joked as being called the so-called Republic of Virtue uh, from a speech that Robes here gave one time. Uh, in the uh, National Convention Assembly. And they created all these radical reforms, including getting rid of Christianity. They actually abolished it uh, in France at this point. And for about 10 years, uh, they had this cult they created, which was based off of deism, deism the so-called deist cult, which was called the cult of the supreme being or something like that. And they had this festival they had every summer, like June 8th, 1794, and so they tried to state the state religion that was based off of deism instead of Catholicism. And um, the Jacobins were crazy. Uh, they literally just, anything that had to do with, you know, the monarchy, uh, the nobility, uh, they got rid of it. So uh, statues of kings, they tried to remove that or cut the heads off statues, uh, things like that. So you didn't want to say anything about having a monarchy or nobility and you'd, you'd be probably killed. Uh, basically, uh, it's kind of true, but they actually like face cards, like, you know, playing card decks. They got rid of the face cards. They don't want anybody to know there's a king and a queen and things like that. Uh, and so um, that was just things like that they were doing. And then um, probably the most radical thing they did uh, in the revolution was they created this thing called the French Republican calendar, or some people call it the French revolutionary calendar. And it was an anti-Christian uh, calendar is what it is, uh, where they were trying to eliminate anything to do with religion, the Catholic faith. And so basically what they did was they started from scratch from what they call year one. Uh, in fact, they didn't want anybody to know like where all the holidays were, Christmas, Easter, uh, any kind of saints holidays uh, that would be eliminated uh, as well. And they made the calendar more based off of things like reason, science, uh, in the age of enlightenment, uh, et cetera. Uh, the calendar was strange. Uh, it started from year one, if you know about this. So year one uh, became 1793. Year two, in this, you know, 1794. Year three, so you know, on, on them, like one, two, three, four, five, basically. Uh, and uh, they would use the calendar for about over 10 years, up to like the time of Napoleon, who later later got rid of it, basically. Uh, the calendar was strange. Uh, it had like uh, still 12 months, but uh, they actually had 10 days a week uh, instead of seven. So you would have three weeks in a month, uh, basically, instead of four, usually. And uh, and then on top of that, they changed all the names of the, the, the months and the days and things like that. Uh, you can see like... Um, Vendemir was like an example of when September, October is. Usually between months is when it actually is. You can see there Vendemir, Brumaire, Freemare, Nevos, Pluvos, Ventos, Germinal, Florial, Prairial, Mesador, Thermidor, Frictador. 
So all these are based off the seasons, basically, is what it is. So Brumaire, you know, fog month, basically, because I guess in October, November, it's foggy in parts of France and things like that. Uh, or a thermidor, it's really hot, like around July. So hot month or heat month, uh, basically. So it's all more, mostly based off of like the seasons and things like that. Uh, and um, the British made fun of it, if you know about this. And uh, the British uh, said that uh, wheezy, sneezy, and freezy, uh, that was, I guess, what they call fall. Slippy, drippy, and nippy was winter. Uh, showery, flowery, and bowery was uh, spring. And then summer was hoppy, crappy, and poppy. <laughs> so they later made fun of it. And it was kind of a ridiculous calendar. But if you know about Cambodia, they tried that too. Uh, the Cambodian Khmer Rouge Revolution in the 20th century where they, year one, you know about that, they did kind of the same thing as well. Uh, eventually what happened was the uh, Jacobins, like the, the radical ones, like the Montagnards, they eventually got overthrown. Uh, and uh, what they call, they call it different names, but sometimes it's called the Them Thermidorian reaction, I think is what they sometimes call it, uh, or revolution. And so moderates took over the country and they instigated this thing called the White Terror around 1794, 95, where they went after anybody that had been a supporter of like Robespierre uh, and his radicals. And uh, you, you could be put in jail or executed too. Uh, Robespierre was, was guillotined himself, as you know. Uh, and um, I think Napoleon, who I think at one point had backed some of the Jacobins, was, was in prison for a while uh, because of that, but they didn't end up killing him. Uh, what ends up happening is uh, they put in a new government. There's uh, Robespierre, of course, his execution right there uh, via guillotine, the incorruptible. But um, eventually they put in a new government, eventually by 1794-95, which was called the French Directory. Uh, and this was a, a government that they put in that was kind of a moderate government that kind of concludes the French Revolution. And... Um, Later, you're going to see the rise of Napoleon in it. You kind of become one of its best generals. Uh, that's under it during the French wars of uh, the French wars of yeah, the French Revolutionary Wars uh, at the time. And uh, the reason why it was called the um, Directory is because it had these five executive directors that ran the executive branch of it. And see on the left there, one of the, the most famous figures of it was Paul Barat. He's going to be one of the directors. That's pretty important. That really helps to give Napoleon a chance. You'll, you'll make Napoleon one of his top generals under him. And part of why Napoleon is able to eventually seize control of France. But it had a legislature, which I don't think it had an official name, uh, but it had like this bicameral legislature, which had two houses. Uh, there was one house. Uh, that was called the Council of 500, which proposed, proposed a lot of the laws of the country. And then it had the Council of Ancients, which had about 250 members, uh, which would actually vote on the laws. And um, <clears throat> anyway, the um, Council of 500 was important because it also picked the directors who the actual executive rulers would be of the country. But you could see Paul Barat, he was the one that really you know, is the one that had the real power later. Uh, but what happens eventually, because of the fact that Napoleon Bonaparte becomes so successful militarily uh, in the French Revolutionary Wars, you're going to see he's eventually going to take power. That's the thing that's going to really happen. I'll get to it later, but Napoleon is going to seize control uh, of the country in 1799 uh, in a coup d'etat. And um, you'll see the age of Napoleon. You know, kind of emerge, of course, after that. And uh, by the way, Napoleon was a um, Corsican. He was from Italy, basically. He'll, of course, become the main leader uh, of the country. So we'll talk about that next week coming up uh, about you know who Napoleon is and what he does, of course, uh, to France, because he kind of helps to end the revolution uh, in 1799. Uh, and, um, and then he'll dominate France and Europe up to about 1814, uh, 1815.